So he comes back and he like locks himself in and they're trying to get into the room and they walk around to the window and he's just there sort of going doo, doo, Yeah he doo, goes doo, Does this <laughs> whoever like the staff's going Does this rock Peter? <laughs> it was just fucking funny Right from the get-go, Berlin Cooling does a great job of world building because we know this world. A lot of people wouldn't. Maybe even most people that would come to watch it. I mean, to be honest, it probably it makes it scarier than it should be because of what the story is about. That's the way it's going to paint the world to an extent. But it does a great job of building that world of, you know, you have the nightclub, everyone goes there. It's, you know, when you live that lifestyle, you're just doing it all the time. Maybe not every night of the week because you physically couldn't, but you're going out, you're going out all the time. You're seeing the same people. You're having many little adventures where you're tripping out. You know, people are do people that are more into the scene than we were, so they would be trying different things all the time, different concoctions in our really civilized way of living nowadays where all the danger and to an extent all the thrill of living has been strangled out of life this is one realm where you can still go off and have many adventures in your own consciousness and dance for eight hours and just feel amazing and also the fact that it is illegal does actually add to it on a small level it just does doesn't it but it does a great job of you know setting up you have the dj and he's going out and he's got the groupies you know you've got the bouncers and the bouncers are in on the scene as well because everyone's a part of the lifestyle the club owner is having to beat the crap out of a dealer because he dealt bad pills in his club and he can't have that because even though unofficially he can't be seen to be approving of that of course that's the whole bread and butter of the whole there's a reason you pay like 30 pound to get in on the door yeah. and it's not because it's um exclusive nightclub or something watching this film it's funny like i was loving the film really enjoying it every bit of it but mostly i was just getting nostalgic about that lifestyle in those days obviously neither of us were ever djs but just going out raving yeah. getting on it having fun that whole atmosphere that whole vibe that whole sort of like subculture where it's just all fun and everyone loving each other and the downside of it as well where you do go a bit mental and your brain can only cane it for so many years and so long before you start suffering the consequences some people more than others and and some people seem to just be like Ozzy Osbourne and be completely invulnerable I shouldn't be drinking alcohol period I really like the relationship and the way they built it up early on between Matilda and Icarus it's a funny thing when you have that setup where first of all Artists like that, creative forces, like they're naturally obviously very creative, also very hard working. But you know, he's a creative person and it's so hard in this modern times where media is such a refined industry and they can squeeze every last drop of potential revenue out of someone's art or someone's creativity. It's a funny thing when you have an artist type having to deal with the business side of things and the industry side of things. Because it's just not their forte. Being a record exec or being a manager is just, it's not even about getting them work necessarily. It's 99% just controlling that ego and controlling that personality. But then there's also that bizarre situation where that manager partner relationship or being like a manager and a girlfriend, you see her straight away in early scenes getting really frustrated by the situation, back taxes, or not having everything accounted for. And you see her getting stressed while he's doing cat in the next room and getting out of his tits like, with his gross little friend that's coming around that she clearly hates. It does a good job of setting it up, their relationship. And what it also does a good job is really getting across the pure ego of DJ Icarus. In the opening scenes, you're like, oh, this guy is good, but I think he thinks he's too good. He, he, he just thinks his music's the best ever and people have different opinions to it and, and that scene in the film uh, later on. It's all kind of setting up that Icarus is flown too close to the sun. He's done too many drugs for too long. He's living his life on the edge for too long and it's all about to blow up in his face and it's coming to a head now. Even his music isn't getting the same love anymore. He's working on this new album all the time, getting it ready. It's nearly ready. That's going to solve all their money problems. That's looming over them. But when they go into the record exec, she's just not interested. She's like, this isn't good. You can do better than this. Like, this isn't like you used to. And everyone else seemed to be of that opinion that he played his early music to for that current version of the album. 
And I think I was the only person where I was like, I'm actually really enjoying it. Like, <laughs> I whenever, it. Yeah, whenever I, I played it, it, I was like, this is good. Like, I'm actually liking it. Der ist auf der Hammer. Der kommt mit drauf. Also, eigentlich ist. But she's basically saying, and she's like a 40 year old woman. She's quite sexy though, actually. She's got like a commanding presence. Yeah, yeah, around, like, a, like a, yeah, dominating presence. She's telling Icarus, this is shit, this is shit, and he can't take it. Mm. I get from these scenes in My the film. My shit rocks. Yeah, yeah. He's like running I, out of uh, Yeah, I get this. <laughs> I get from the thing in this film that his ego has become so inflated. He just sees himself as a god, essentially. Mm. <laughs> like, and we meet some of his family as well, where you see his yeah. brother is obviously he's gone to uni and he's always done the straight laced like thing you're supposed to do, make dad proud. He's going to church still. His dad is actually a priest. Mm. And I really liked he goes in to see. It's a perfect counterbalance where his brother's already there and he's watching his dad and he's like enjoying the preaching. Icarus walks in late with a bottle of half drunk Corona. Yeah, yeah. I saw and he just yeah. sits down and he's got his sunglasses on. And he looks like a goblin. I actually really liked the dad's sermon as well because one thing growing up, like I don't go to church and I don't believe in God and all that, but going to church when I was young, one thing I always liked was some of the some of the sermons would be boring as fuck because it's just the priest reading like from the Bible. But some of them, you know, they'd go off into philosophy or a current event or they just they sometimes really would explore interesting thoughts in an interesting way a lot more than I've ever seen represented in films and telly. I think he was talking about preserving the environment, like yeah. green spaces and stuff. Not something you associate with yeah, the yeah. church. And before this, this girl's are all over Icarus in a toilet. They're doing like copious amounts of drugs. She's trying to fuck him yeah and he's like nope nope gotta go and see my dad so you can really see like the divide from there to like there also see the good side of him like he isn't that was good, yeah. he like he doesn't start off like he's some complete out of control egomaniac piece of shit he is a lovable good guy who's getting that creepiness that comes along with doing way too many drugs yeah. for too long like you know that sort of coke personality someone gets where they just kind of get obnoxious and weird and creepy about them and he's got a bit of that coming through there's obviously a bit of resentment from icarus towards the other brother because he probably gets a pat on the back all the time and is told no, you're you're doing good but he's you know he's never had a fully paying job and he even admits like you know icarus is right like these pl places are taking advantage of me you know i've never had a proper full paying job at the age of 30 because i go from apprenticeship to apprenticeship but you could see he was jealous of Icarus. Yeah. There is that grass is always greener thing. And you sometimes think, if you told me now, none of your dreams will come true and you won't get married and have a family. Like, that's just definite for your future. I'd be like, well, fucking, I may as well just do loads of drugs and, yeah. like, have loads of, and just not worry about health or any of that stuff. <laughs> do you know what I mean? And you see that sort of, they're looking into the other versions of timelines of their lives if they made different choices. The dad who's a straight-laced priest, still doesn't agree with it. He says, are you still doing this DJ Icarus mm. stuff? Your brother's got a, you know, a job in an office and you look ill. <laughs> when, <laughs> and he's just yeah. there. Like, he is like a goblin. <laughs> yeah. like, when you create something in this kind of world, it's very easy for films a lot of the time to just to do cartoon one-dimensional characters. There's the drug hound. There's the drug dealer. There's the creepy guy there's the guy who's boiled his breath there's the disapproving dad who's just like the villain and he's not the villain in this he is a well-rounded character he completely loves his son he wasn't like you're a waste of space you're this he was just kind of like oh you're still doing that thing you still got that hobby he didn't get it it was more just he didn't get that what he was about and what he was doing it's good acting and it's a good character arc i guess because like when you look at him on the service, like doing that sermon and round the table, he looks like a fucking proper German bulldog character. It's like mm. this guy, man. He, he he. I bet he's never hugged his kids or shown his kids any affection. And then later on in the film, we find out to find out, sorry, that that isn't the case. And I did I did like that about it. He's a really loving father. He's a good father. He just felt like a real character. Like I mm. believe that was his dad. But anyway, so it builds towards the crux of the film, which is the fact that Matilda's still worried about bills and this and that, but he's just kind of like, not even ignoring it, he's just nearly oblivious to it. And he's like, I'm going out to party, you want to come? Yeah, yeah. So they, he goes out and uh, he's getting on it and his friend gives him some pills. 
and whatever's in them, we find out later there's some bad chemicals, which bad. I can't remember the name PCP. of, or pro- probably pronounce. Oh, is it PCP? PCP, yeah. Well, anyway, there was bad stuff in it, and he ends up eating breakfast in a hotel with loads of other normal families and people on holiday or, you know, businessmen who have come in for to Berlin for a business meeting. All these people, and then there's him having breakfast with the buffet, mixing in flowers with his porridge and smearing butter and egg all over his face. And it that really fucking cracked me up. But it was funny, but it was funny in a grounded, dramatic sort of way. It wasn't like comical or cartoonish. The subtle acting of the waiter who comes over and he's just sort of... Like, we've all had that thing where you meet someone, maybe a homeless person or someone, and then a couple of seconds in, you realise, oh, this person's fucking crazy. You know when you're, like, on a holiday and then, you know, you get breakfast included with a hotel and then you have to fucking go down and it's all buffet and all this shit and you're dreadfully hung over mm. and then everyone's looking at you and they know you're hung over and you're like don't fucking look at me oh. it's like that and a second thing it really brought up you know when you go to like afters after a rave or, a, mm. or an all night drinking and then you have to go home and then you have to like go for a park and someone's walking their dog or doing something normal and you're old like, people are getting up to do <laughs> yeah, their shopping yeah. and you're just like oh, there's a guy there's an old person fucking i remember like getting out of Palmer's Green Station once and an old guy had like slowly ambled in to pick up like three free metros and I was like I'm, <laughs> I'm tripping out here man like, I had to just fucking and you're just twitching out yeah, being like, yeah. and now at... everyone's looking at you like but they're just... not as well yeah, they're I know. not looking at you you're just sitting there like this and like your internal dialogue's like they're looking at me man and it oh it just even if they're not you just, out. you just suddenly you're aware of how disgusting you are like yeah, you just yeah, feel yeah. disgusting you, you like. haven't washed your all just sweaty they, like, they just come up from a refreshed eight hours sleep and probably had their had their five but, a day the day before and you're just crawling around like this creature of the night but on the flip side to that i also do laugh when i see people that have been to like raves you know like you go to work on a train on a monday and it's all like business people and you see like a guy and a girl just sitting there with their sunglasses like <laughs> and you're like ha, ha, yeah i know man but yeah so he takes the bad pill he ends up in a right state and he wakes up in a mental institute now it kind of starts getting into a, a really nice one flow of the cuckoo nest vibe but again nurt ratchet is replaced by actually a very empathetic if slightly self-serving doctor yeah. it sets up her character nicely because their first meeting she's saying look it's voluntary if you want to leave but i want to get the t- at least please stay till we get the testing back on exactly what you took because you did have a psychotic episode he's like fair enough that makes sense she clearly like he gets the vibe immediately like she used to rave and do drugs and she's not some snooty like drugs are bad for you person he even finds her book which is all about drug culture and the uh, lasting effects yeah. of fun with drugs or whatever it's called it's basically about drugs so clearly she's of that vibe probably used to party herself she also is then like oh you can read it if you want and he's like no thanks and it sets up nicely that she's thinking oh this is a famous dj who i get as my own case study Mm. Uh, you know this might be my next book this might give me you know national put me on the national stage and get more book sales or whatever so she's not a bitch she's not evil she's not nurse ratchet but she isn't 100% 100% Mother Teresa either. She's looking for his acceptance and he, DJ Icarus, is patronising her. Like, nah, nah, like throwing it away. Mm. And that's probably like her greatest achievement, that little book. Like, do you know mm. what I mean? But before this, Matilde, she kind of saves the day a little bit here because she finds Rat Drug Dealer in the club. I call him Rat Drug Dealer because he is. He's a little golem. Uh, in, in, the, in the club toilets and says, look, Icarus has gone missing what did you give him and he and she gives him the pills and then she gives it to test them so i wonder what would have happened if they never tested the pill i guess he would have just got better by himself but Mm. it's good to know the treatment i guess here in england that i think our our laws on drugs are vastly behind other countries i'm not just talking about like weed in america we 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 just come back from portugal Mm, um we saw a lot of well, we saw a lot of drug use. You know, I spotted that guy from the fucking tower. <laughs> that, actually, we got to talk about that, and yeah. then we will get into the film. But this, no, honestly, I got to give you your fucking credit, man. We were drinking in like a rooftop bar, pretty high. Behind yeah. us, there was this whole courtyard and a fountain. Not exaggerating, a hundred feet away. Phil was looking over my shoulder. I had my back to it. 
he spotted a couple who looked like ants from where we were and he was like i think they're doing drugs and i looked over and i was like how the fuck yeah, could you possibly that. say that yeah. and then i looked and that just faintly you could see her sort of sniffing something rubbing her nose and then him brushing off his arm which was clearly brushing the last bit fragments of coke off yeah mate you should be working for the fucking fbi or mi5 that was unbelievable the thing why you know you can just like get a vibe like they were so like there was other people in this square and they were so separated from it i was like they've got to be doing something um and then we saw that but i guess but we, they had those subtle little like, yeah yeah it was a weird twitch they, they, and they were they like kind of like shielding themselves mm. as well but i guess my main point is in portugal they've decriminalized a lot of drugs so they'll, they'll have uh, you know initiatives like for people that want to inject heroin they'll go to like a little building where the needles are sterilized to mm. stop you know hiv aids all of that if you get caught you don't get in trouble and their rates of drug crime have gone like that like do you know what yeah. i mean so it's just smart like it's it just, smart, just smart yeah They're in this insane um, asylum. Do you think that's what that? Whatever. You know what yeah, we're mental, saying. mental place. And <laughs> <laughs> mental place yeah. is definitely um, good. And this is quite a funny scene as well. DJ Icarus is kind of like walking around, finding his room. And then all of a sudden, like a little attendant <laughs> comes along and was like, oh, you're DJ Icarus. And like, he's there with his fucking new j bait. He's like, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and you can tell he's just absolutely buzzing. And then he's just any favour he wants or like getting out when yeah. he wants or sneaking out or sneaking in booze. Like he just gets it whenever he wants now. This kind of reminds me of a story, not that I was in a, a sane asylum viewers, but when I used to work on a, a ward, you know. A mental health ward. Well, it was a mental health ward, but I wasn't an inpatient. I was an administrator on the ward. Let me note that. The, my manager, who was a nurse, nice lady, good manager, actually. I was just on the reception, front reception, and she'd like, come running up, like, all excited. I was like, why are you so excited? Like, it's Monday, no one wants to be here. She's, like, giggling like a, like a girl, just like a 40-year-old woman. She's like, Michael Palin's just come onto the ward. No way. Yeah, and I looked over, and, like, obviously, he had he must have had a relative, like, within the ward, like, sadly, that must have had dementia. I looked over, fucking Michael Palin from Monty Python, sitting on the fucking That's tape. That's fucking but, sick. But all the other people that come in Declan, they're like, oh, fuck them. They're running over, do you want some tea, Michael? <laughs> Cup of tea, Michael. I'm like, no one else got that. So you set up, he starts meeting all his little friends. He, his neighbour's really funny who he comes in and he's got this USA top that he's always freaking out that he thinks is missing, but he's actually wearing it. And he comes in and he's yeah. just, he just sort of, something about the performance, the way he bobs about and he's like, you're a musician? Because he yeah. sees him working on his album because the nurse lets him bring in his yeah, decks and stuff to work on it. And he's like, yep. And he walks out and then he pops his head back around the corner and he was like, was that girl visiting your girlfriend? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can tell he's just like, he's like, this is the coolest patient I've ever had, like, as my neighbour. But what's interesting is he does just come and go as he yeah. wants. So he really, not only is it voluntary, he's just kind of like sneaking out at times, sneaking back, doing what he wants. So it's nice that the the movie isn't refined to this one location for him for the rest of the film. And that kind of pisses off Chief Nurse because she's like, look, are you going to stay or come back or mm. keep going or coming back? But poor Matilda still has to be the one suffering all the stresses yeah. on the outside because she's the one going to the record exec. She's saying, can I have a, an extension? Record exec is just, she's like, nah. I'm dropping the album. I'm shelving the album. I'm I need to put something else in that space now. And she's also dealing with all these other stresses. Did you see the lesbian affair coming? Um, I did. I clocked it from their first hello. I wrote in my notes. Remember they see each other in the club for the first time in ages at the start. Yeah, she's like, "What are you doing tonight?" But they no, they kiss on the lips yeah. to say hello. And I was immediately like, "Oh, put that in my notes." Well, like, no, as soon as they kissed on the lips, I was like. But it was a hello kit. It yeah. could have just been a hello still, just on the edge. But I took from that that obviously Matilde is bisexual, and she probably had a yeah, she, yeah, yeah. Well, she hundred percent. They might have. They, she, they, they probably had, had a relationship priors, before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then like she, you know, DJ Icarus is committed to the the mental institution. She's just looking for some semblance of comfort from someone, mm. and then you know. And it's fair enough, you know, like when you're fucking up so much 
making mistakes, choosing bad choices to the point where you end up in an insane asylum and your girlfriend's stuck in loads of debt because of you. You can't really be mad if she goes off with someone else. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, he one of the times he sneaks out, just before he discovers she's been sleeping with the giant lesbian daughter. Bouncer, yeah. Bouncer. He cheats on her as well with that groupie. Yeah. You gotta think though, Declan, from Matilda's point of view, she's just basically his carer. She, mm. She's trying to pay the bill. She goes in, he's monging out of ketamine in the corner, like you know, she's doing everything. He's just fucking worse up. than carer. She's having to be the mum, exactly. Really, and yeah, that yeah. is the last. That is the ultimate ruiner relationship mm. position to put a woman in. So he he gets out, he cheats on her. He goes home, he discovers them in bed together, and he kind of doesn't want to face it. He goes off, he's like, I'm looking for a certain record or something. Yeah. He kind of just distracts himself away from the emotion of it. And she goes over and she's trying to like be like, get out. And the lesbian door woman, who I actually really like as a character, she's very reasonable. She's not done anything wrong, really. You shouldn't really, obviously, sleep with a person that's with someone else. But when they're in the midst of breaking up because the other person's being a dickhead, it's nearly your job if you feel like you could have a good thing with that person to swoop in. Like, that is just what you're supposed to do. It just is what it is. Yeah, yeah. And the only time where I was like, what are you doing that for? Is when she goes over and hugs Matilda, starts kissing her, whilst he's, like, right next to him in, obviously, a miserable moment. Yeah. And I was thinking, why are you being such a bitch until it leads to an awesome threesome scene? Yeah. I, uh, <laughs> Were you seeing I, this coming? No, I, to be fair, I did see it coming because I was like, before, because he banged a groovy before, he banged mm. Matilda, Matilda, whatever. And I'm like, this fucking bald goblin geezer, man. I know he's a DJ, but the girls love him. And then when he goes in and I see that, I'm like, I bet he gets a threesome out of this. And I like, slam my really? fist down. And I was like, I was thinking, I need to be a DJ, man. Oh, yeah, <laughs> a German Never DJ. Too late, right? Yeah, yeah. Even in after the freezing, you can see in you know visually the way they tell the story, you can see that they're cuddling to one side and he's just off to on the other side of the bed, yeah. unable to sleep. Freeze him or not, he's very much on the outside of this situation. So he goes off, you know, he goes back to the home and he's kind of like he's freaking out at one point. You know, he locks himself in his bedroom. And he's like just in the dancing, mental hospital. Going, this rocks. Yeah, I love when they're, they're trying rock. to get in and all because he's just showed up after he's gone missing. For yeah, like yeah, day, yeah, yeah. Because that little Cause fan of his sign him out. Yeah, a uh, fan of his let him out. So he comes back <laughs> and he like locks himself in and they're trying to get into the room and they walk around to the window and he's just there sort of going. Doom, doom, yeah, he doom, goes. Doom. Does this whoever like the staffs going? Does this rock, Peter? <laughs> it was just fucking funny. <laughs> could see it was this sense of it was nearly like he was being defiant and just going to the one thing he believes in and loves which is his music because he is passionate about his music he genuinely that comes first yeah yeah and the lifestyle before money and everything that's what partly why he got into the trouble he got into the relationship between him and the doctor is starting to deteriorate she's getting a bit sick of him and we have the most one flow of the cuckoos moment in the whole film where he sneaks in a bunch of hookers and has a big party, which really... I know they weren't hookers in One Flow of the Cookie Nest, but it was nearly like that scene was completely lifted out. The, I reckon it has been taken from that. Because remember in One Flew Over the Cookie Nest, you got an Indian chief who says nothing. Mm. There's a similar character in this who's dressed in like Indian... This section where, of the film is One Flow of the Cookie Nest. Yeah, yeah. With a nice nurse ratchet. That's um, um, oh, it was just hilarious because you got like super fan like just sucking someone's I lo- tits. I loved he got peer pressured into it. You know that? Like, <laughs> yeah. He was like, no, no, just four beers. And then he like and turns up with like fucking ten hookers. Like. <laughs> yeah, and he's good. saying like, before you come in, they are a bit weird here. <laughs> and then like just looking at them like, it's fucking hilarious, man. And she wants to throw him out and, and more or less does throw him out at this point. But then Matilda comes in and she kind of like, she's going back and forth because she's breaking up with him, but she doesn't just want to abandon him. She doesn't hate him. It just is what it is. And she says to the doctor, like, you look me in the eyes and tell me he isn't also just a case study to you. He isn't a, a yeah. chance where you get this world famous DJ and you get to do your next thesis on him. So I think what gets him to start taking the pills is they actually diagnose him with schizophrenia. So it's nice nurse Ratchet is saying basically you've had this situation due to taking a bad pill, but you do have underlying episodes of 
schizophrenia. Mm. That's why your life has become so crazy. Not because of all the drugs. It's because of your your psyche, the schizophrenia. Then he agrees, yes, I do need to take these pills. And you get the father comes in as well and you get more insight as he's talking to the doctor. More insight to his character and how empathetic and how much he does actually love his son. But also about, you know, their mother dying and how his two sons just reacted in very different ways and they went their different paths as a result of it. You know, there's that lovely moment where he's walking out and he sees his son off to the side and he goes over and hugs him. And it's just a lovely moment. And this whole sequence, it's interesting because he's taking these heavy duty pills prescribed by the doctor. He actually gets released. He's been making new music inside there and it's this sort of happy music and... You know, they Matilda and the lesbian bouncer brings it to the record executive and they love it. And they even want to do a photo shoot in the mental health unit. And, you know, the doctor goes along with it and he's not sure about it. And he wants to call it like techno tits, techno and, trumpets, tits and trumpets, which I thought was good. I love that name, but she wanted to call <laughs> it Berlin like Calling. Boring. Which is a better name, to be fair. Yeah, Berlin it, is, calling it, is, it is a good, yeah. But you see, he actually is taking other people's input. You know, the whole way through, he refuses to listen to anyone. He doesn't want to read your woman's book. He doesn't want to know anything from anyone. And now he's actually taken input. For the stability of his life, you can see it's going to be good. Because he has this new album out that's going to do great. And he's out of the hospital. But even when his dad's asking him when he first is released in church, in a beautiful moment where I love the fact that his dad's playing the organ, and you see they really bond over it and he's kind of enamored like this wow what a, this he's so obviously his love for music mm-hmm. icarus is looking at it and he's so amazed by the size of it and the beautiful sounds it's making and then his dad asks him like are you sure you're going to be okay when you're released like are you going to be okay by yourself and he says no the pills work don't worry it takes away the highs and lows and that's such a sad compromise that kind of is true in life. Like it's, it depends on what highs and lows you want. Because even if you have healthy highs from, I don't know, mountain climbing, it's only a high because there's the danger. It's chasing the dragon. Yeah, and there is a thing of life in order to have true security and safety in your own mind and body and whatever and circumstances. To an extent, you have to compromise and say no to the highs and lows that are on offer. And highs and lows are beautiful, like even low moments. I'm not talking about depression, which is like a flattening of emotions, but, you know, some of the worst moments of my life are memorable and, you know, I like the roller coaster. It's the same reason you can enjoy a sad film because yeah, yeah. having sad feelings sometimes or feeling melancholy is just, it's part of the human experience and you want to hit all the notes at different times. Going back to the father bit, I'm going all the way back to when the father. I got a bit emotional in this scene because when the, the when the the father's first in the doorway in the precipice, I was wondering is the father going to be really stern here and be like, look at the state of you, look at your fucks, like you know what I mean? Which many people would do, maybe. Like I've told you how many times you and haven't had a proper well. job, and he just hugged him, and I just really like that. Now on the subject of these pills, it's true to real life. As in today, like you go to the doctors with depression. What 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 do they do, Declan? Do they say no? Uh, let's offer you some counselling. There's going to be a wait in this, but what you really need to do is get to the root of the problem. The first thing they do, Declan, is like, oh, we don't have the time or budget for this. We've got we're we're twenty minutes late for our next phone appointment. Here's a six month course of antidepressants. You can't get feelings if you're, there's no feelings at all. <laughs> mm. Do you know what I mean? So like, it, it's very much. And you it, didn't. You tried it for like a week and then went off, didn't you? Yeah. So I can be honest with it. Um, I got very bad uh, depression lows, and that was a mixture of things within my own self, not 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 loving or liking myself. Um, a lot of heavy drinking, which is yeah. a depressant in itself. And I was on it for about fucking two weeks, Declan. I can't remember the name of the pill. It's irrelevant anyway. I felt fucked. Mm. Like, literally, the first couple of days, I would be a bit like DJ Icarus, I guess, but he seemed to be all right. Like, loads of people would come around and see me, relatives, aunties, whatever, to like, because I was in a bad way. And I'd put, they'd be as close as I am to you. They'd be speaking to me. 
I can't. I could hear what they're saying, but I just didn't have the strength to like have a. I just be like sort of disassociate. Yeah, I just be like everything seems so slow. I just be like, yeah. Mm. And it's like as a fucking like like zombie. And obviously, I went to like actual talking therapy, and you get to the 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 the, the bottom of. You know, we call it, I call it the inner voice, the the voice that we saying, you're worthless, you're a piece of shit. Once you address that and, you know, get off the substances and the addiction and everything, it, it becomes better. And there's no way I could have got to this stage if I just done the tablet route because I wouldn't have addressed the real issues. I would have just been numb. So and that is... And that is totally opinion. valid. And just to give the flip side, I got great success off antidepressants and... Really? Oh, absolutely fantastic. Completely changed my life and allowed me to then give me the mental space to actually address stuff. So there's no one route to sorting things out. Everyone's different and that's fine. Yeah, Just yeah. Give... I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not to know, to know. Like, obviously we're not doctors. I'm not putting either no, route you're, down. You're talking Just, about yeah, your yeah. own experience. That's absolutely um, fine. I'm just giving the other side. And also, it's literally was my experience. So it makes sense to give the other side. Did you, did you not feel like shit when you first started? Like, did you not I, have like headaches? I got, and... No. And I, that's obviously just body chemistry or something. But no, I was, I was just, I felt, I felt surprisingly great even from the get-go even though it's supposed to take about six weeks so maybe it was a bit what, what they do like they we had discussions about it i said to you why am i so fucking thirsty <laughs> well, yeah. they make you so thirsty like do you know what I mean? yeah maybe you didn't get the best prep info as well about what it's going to be like and how to go about it and what things you need to do but i guess the main overriding message is that and, and this is a good film for it if you're suffering from you know any form of mental health please do speak to someone about it and don't take it in. But going back to the film, yeah, I found it, I found it very sad, actually. You know, I guess he has to take this medication, but, you know, I've had, like, lows in my life, and now I think back on those lows, I think you summed it up perfectly, actually. I can't really explain it. Those lows have made me a better person. Like, experiencing those lows and getting through it, you know, ha- has made me a more, like, rounded person to face life. And if you take away those lows, Declan, how are you supposed to enjoy the heights? Yeah. <laughs> and even I mean? going one further, I actually just, in a certain way, enjoy those low moments. Yeah. In a certain weird way that's hard to describe. Genuinely, you know, because it, 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 there's always a flip side to what you're experiencing. Like, in, even immense grief is with a bunch of other people is also the flip side of it is a real closeness with those people at that yeah. time so there's always a yeah. sort of different way to it the only thing you don't want to feel is depressed because that's where emotions go into a vacuum and you just feel nothing which is horrendous but going back to the film he comes out you know his new album is a insane success but he seems a bit lost and untethered because he's on these pills which are helping him but they're sort of making him flat his record exec is saying, are you sure you're going to be able to go on tour? Like, are you sure you're going to be able to hack it? He's not even like, yeah, I'll be able to hack it. He's like, I need it. Like, you can see he needs it. He needs to be back on stage. He needs that natural high. And he needs his music back. His music, even before the drugs, I truly believe, is his real passion and love. But he goes off his pills just before it. You see in that moment of frustration, which happens to a lot of people, at the worst possible time, his old goblin evil <laughs> yeah. not evil but little slimy little hanger on drug dealer Gollum. yeah little hanger on shows up with the groupie girl and they come in they start doing drugs they sort of just invite themselves in how scared were you because my heart started thumping in that scene where his friend's offering him all these different drugs oh. and while when his friend goes oh. to the toilet pours them all into a big pile pours them into his coke and he's about to drink it. And I was like, no, don't end like this movie. Don't suck a punch me. I was, I thought he was going to do it, if I'm honest with you. Like, I thought, fuck it, he's going to do it. But I liked the way it turned out as a big fuck you to the goblin drug dealer. He was like, oh, Martin, that's 800 euros of, of product. And then I loved it. Like, the big fuck you. He was just like, I'll pay for it. And just walked out the door. <laughs> and I'm not even sure if it was an entirely a fuck you to them. Might have even been a bit of a a bit of affection to them in at least a poetic sense mate in the moment you'd just be like you just wasted our drugs but 
in a poetic sense, it's nearly like he's getting rid of their drugs as well. He's just getting rid of it. Trying and to, then trying walking to out. help him. And you could see the look on the girl's face. Like, maybe she'll just go back to it, but maybe she'll think about that and maybe she'll actually stop what she's doing because it's probably not going to end well for her either. So I thought it was interesting that ultimately he walks from there, knocks on Matilda's door, and she's back on tour with him. And the film ends with that same sort of shot of them just sitting bored in an airport waiting for their flight and i thought it was a, nearly a sense of what did you think that meant did you think they went back to their old life do you think they just found themselves full circle going back to the same situation i guess it it, it leaves it up to the audience's perception much like the you know spinning top at the the end of inception or yeah. something like that but i like it because the last two scenes you know it, it, it perfectly like summed it up the ending like fuck drugs i want to just i want the music to be everything the touring everything like that so i, I think the last two scenes were like very good it did it, 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 you know it did go full so you're right it started off with a plane taking off to go touring and then it ended with them waiting for a plane mm. to take off go touring so very very good ending i thought I don't know if they could have done it better, but yeah, there was a there's a slight ambiguity and sort of full circle ness to it where it was it was sort of the perfect ending because ultimately it's one of those things where it's a character arc. There's not a plot point where they can hit it and that's the ending. So ultimately, you always have to find some sort of clever or interesting creative way just to end it. It certainly was a better ending from an audience perspective than him drinking the drink of drugs and then collapse that would have just been a kick in the that would have been stupid reason. yeah do i recommend it yeah um as as someone that used to go raving used to like the raven scene it's a very good film brings up a lot of nostalgia it's films with the film doesn't really have a plot to say to speak of it's, it's that classic guy goes crazy on drugs and the redemption arc but i think it's very well done and and the acting's very good in it declan that None of it was wooden. I sort of appreciate all the characters from the dad to DJ Chris to Paul Matilde. And I think just for like an hour and a half, an hour and 40, it's well worth the time for the viewer, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely recommend this. It is very entertaining, really funny, really sad, really well written, really well acted. Small little independent film that obviously became really big in Germany, but I'd never heard of and I've heard of a lot of films. In terms of whether you know about this world and you delved into it or you hadn't and it's all new, I'd recommend it to you either way. Maybe even more so if you haven't delved into this world because it's one of the best films in terms of capturing that sense of having fun and drug use. You know, Philip K. Dick used to call it because he was, you know, avid drug user with all his friends and he used to talk later in his books and interviews about the friends he lost along the way doing it and he used to call it playing in traffic you know we just we couldn't stop playing in traffic we loved it and a few of us got hit by cars this movie beautifully captures that lifestyle and what it's like when it goes wrong so easy recommendation for berlin calling <laughs>